So last week we started the book of Colossians and we were looking at, you know, kind of a, some, some things about the book, you know, that it was written by Paul. It was written in 62 AD and from prison. It was also in Rome that Paul actually wrote this. Uh, we looked at the fact that Colossae was a city about 120 miles from Ephesus. So it would have been impacted by Paul's ministry in that area. And Paul, of course, he begins to express his communication on behalf of the saints there and his um, really in hearing about their faith. He begins to express his communication to God about their hope that they have and about the truth that was actually expressed to them as they're seeing things as they really are. And then their love, because their love really shows that they did accept the message. And it is very well known among the saints at this point. So now as we move on in the book of Colossians, we come to knowing his will. And this is something that as Christians, we really do need to take the time to constantly remind ourselves of how to actually understand and fulfill the, the desirous will of God. And this is Paul's ex, um, desire or his communication for the saints here is to be filled with the experiential knowledge of his will. So in Colossians chapter one and verse nine, it says, because of this, we also from the first day we heard, do not cease communicating in worship and asking concerning you in order that you should be filled with the full experiential knowledge of his desires will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So here, Paul is actually wanting the saints to not just know God's will, but actually experience it. And the only way we can experience it is to actually do it. So it's knowing his desires will in an experiential way. Now, how do we as Christians actually know what God's desires will is for us? We always need to start out with what has already been revealed, because the reality is, God does not contradict himself. God doesn't lie. God's not going to tell us one thing in one area and then tell us to do something completely different in another area. So when God actually expresses his desires will for us as Christians in scripture, that is something that we should pay close attention to. And that is something that we can use in any situation to weigh whether or not it actually is God's desires will for us. We start out with presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. Are you able in the situation to, in presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, live out a way that actually manifests that? This is over in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Of course, here he says, I beseech you, brethren, or your word beseech here can also be, I encourage you, brethren. By the tender compassions of God, this is not mercy. He's not looking at relief from sin. He's actually looking at the compassion that God has given to us because of who we are in Christ, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And that, of course, reasonable service is our religious service. And it's a reasonable response to what God has done. God paid for us. Remember, Christ died for our sins on the cross. He was raised, showing that we're justified before God. He actually paid the debt. It is only reasonable that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, in response to that, of course, we should also then be transformed by the renewed mind that we have, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And this should be another aspect of understanding God's will. As a matter of fact, we're going to need to use this in order to understand God's will. So in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, and do not be, or really he's saying, stop being conformed to this world. And your word conformed there means to put on a mask. And your word world there isn't actually talking about the world system, it's talking about the age that relates to being a legal person, somebody who is trying to please God through law. It says, stop putting on a mask as if you're one who is abiding by law. And the context, you understand what he's talking about when he's referring to uh, age there. Your word um, world there is actually age. Now remember, age is a period in which God is showing something about himself to intelligent beings. In the context of Romans, it's talking about how 
uh, especially the Jews going all the way back into chapter 10, where they tried to actually produce their own righteousness and they were ignoring the righteousness of God, which had to do with faith. We don't want to be ones who are conforming ourselves, that is putting on a mask as if we're ones who are law abiders. He goes on, but we trans but be transformed by the renewedness of your mind. Transform is metamorphed. It is beginning to manifest outwardly what is inside. And remember that renewing is not a verb here. It kind of sounds like it in some of our translations. It's actually a noun. We possess a renewed mind and we need to use it. And as we use it, that's going to transform our appearance to others because we're going to begin to show outwardly what we are inwardly. We're going to begin to live out our Christian life. That you may prove. Now, your word proving is your testing term. You're putting the situation to the test, and you're determining whether or not it is actually God's will. You're looking for what is good in the situation. You're not looking for what is bad. You're weighing it to say, is this God's desirous will? Does it line up with what I know his desirous will is for me? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will. Well, that word, that word perfect is mature. And your word will there is desirous will. And it's kind of important to understand because God has a determinate will and God's determinate will will get done. But God also has a desirous will. He desires certain things for us as Christians. And as Christians, of course, we should actually go after that because those are the things that are the best for us. He also talks about the fact that as part of his desirous will, he wants us to be able to use our spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18 talks about this. In 1 Corinthians 12, 18, it says, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleases. Little difficult to pick it out in some of our translations, but your word pleases is as he desirously willed. Now, if it is his desirous will to determine what parts of the body there are, it would make sense that it is his desirous will for those members put in that part of the body to actually express it. To use what God has actually provided for him. Now, in the context, he is talking about spiritual gifts and how they relate to the body of Christ. Each one of us, when we believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day, we are placed into the body of Christ, that new creation, where Christ is the head and we, the church, are the body. You see that over in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We are not a new creature. It's the Christ is a new creation. We're placed into that. We're immersed into that by the Holy Spirit. And when we're immersed, we are given a spiritual gift that relates to the benefit of the body. We're to actually use it. We shouldn't be ignorant about spiritual gifts. How can you be ignorant about spiritual gifts and actually use your spiritual gift properly? And what do I mean by ignorant? There's some people who want to go around and they want to say that certain gifts that are not active today are active. Speaking in tongues is an example of this. What was the purpose of the gift? The purpose of the gift was to give Israel a sign that God was doing something different. And it's very clear in scripture that's exactly what it was. And it was actually speaking in an actual dialect. It wasn't speaking in nonsense. But yet today, there's some people who want to say they speak in tongues. That's completely false. Prophecy. We have the complete revelation. Anybody coming saying that they have prophecy, that's not a spiritual gift that's active right now. Somebody who is an apostle. There's only 12 apostles. It's very clear from scripture. Anybody claiming to be an apostle today is not a true apostle. We have the gift of healing, which was again used as a sign to Israel. These are all gifts that aren't active anymore, and they're not to be, you know, because if you're trying to apply them in the church, you don't actually have the gift. But there are a bunch of gifts that actually are active, and those are the ones that relate to the edifying of the body. A pastor, a teacher, one who is of helps, administration, giving, all of these uh, other types of, of 
spiritual gifts are active and they are for the edification of the saints, not for an individual person's edification. We are to use that gift. Now, what if we don't know our spiritual gift? How do you actually use your spiritual gift? And this is where you can go in, in relation to weighing God's desires will for you. Well, whether I know my spiritual gift or not, because it's, a, it's something, it's a gracious thing that's given to me. The only way I'm going to actually use it is if I'm with other saints. I can't use it any other place. So I already understand by the fact that God wants me to use my spiritual gift that I need to be fellowshipping with other saints. That's a very important thing in the Christian life. So if there's a situation where I am not able to actually fellowship with other saints, it's not God's desire well for me to be involved with that. And I should be rejecting that. It is also revealed that God's desires will is that we give ourselves to the Lord and then to other believers. Second Corinthians chapter eight and verse five talks about this. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the desirous will of God. See, their focus wasn't about the things that they had. Their focus was about caring for other saints. And in the context, of course, he's talking about those who are giving a financial gift to support other saints. And Paul is looking at them saying, you are, you're, you're so poor, you're poorer than the people you're trying to actually help out. And they were like, no, this is something that we think that we want to do. It's not, well, not think. They determined they were going to do it. Because first of all, they gave themselves to the Lord. And of course, in relation to us as Christians, in financially supporting the ministry, that actually is an important thing. Remember where our money is at, where we put our money really does show where our attention is at, where our focus is at. Are we putting it into worldly things or are we putting it into spiritual things? Now, of course, in the context, it is talking about giving properly. We don't give a tithe. And I've talked about that many times. It's so important for us as Christians to understand that. You take care of your own, and then what you have left over, you decide in your heart what you're going to give and give it freely. But that involves us to actually be ones who are first giving ourselves to the Lord. So first of all, our focus is on being servants of God. And then secondly, how are we actually taking care of the saints? Because this is according to God's desire as well. Now, again, if I'm in a situation where I'm not able to do this, I know it's not God's desire as well for me. Now, I might be in a situation where it could be one way or the other. I don't know. Because this involves discerning what is God's will. You're weighing the situation. Each one of these. Where is the benefit for whatever I'm about to start getting involved with in relation to manifesting God's desire's will? What part of his will can I do that in? And then, of course, we also have serving the Lord, even with our emotions. Now, this is over in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 6 and 7. And here it says, not with eye service as men pleasers. But as bondservants of Christ, doing the desirous will from the heart, with good will doing service as unto the Lord, not, not unto men. So it's, of course, talking about the fact that we are ones who are being obedient, but not ones who are after pleasing men, but actually the things that we do in our lives are because of who we belong to, which would be God. Now, in the context here, that word heart actually doesn't mean heart in the sense of the center of a person. That word heart is actually the Greek word for soul, and it means out from your soul. And when you begin to understand the concept of the soul, it's talking about our emotional center. So, yeah, typically our relationship with God is a spiritual relationship. That means it's logical. It's rational. But that doesn't mean we leave our emotions behind. 
our emotion should actually be involved with it. Our emotion should never lead. So it's not like we're only looking to see what pleases us in relation to our desires will or in relation to how we're actually um, living out our Christian life. But there are situations where, hey, we have a choice on different things to do. And one of them we would really like to be involved with where others, hey, not so much. And that's an option for us. You know, that's part of his desire as well, that we are actually also using our emotions. It's not all about just spiritual. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand that. It's important for us as Christians to understand, first and foremost, we have a rational relationship with God. It's in the spirit. Our emotion should follow that. And we should be emotionally connected to what we're doing. Nothing wrong with that. Be set apart. That is, be sanctified. And abstain from fornication. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5 talk about this. For this is the will of God. Again, this is the term desirous will of God. It's not as determinate will. So this is the desirous will of God. Your sanctification, that is you being set apart. That you abstain from, now our translation here says sexual immorality, but it's actually the word fornication. So it's sex outside of marriage. And in the context, that's what he's talking about here. Because fornication can mean a couple of different things. Fornication can mean in relation to getting involved with false teaching and other uh, idols and other stuff like that. You know, spiritual or religious. But this one's talking about your own body that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passions of the lust like the Gentiles do. We of the church should be ones who stand out because we refuse to be involved in the fornication that the Gentiles want to be involved in. That is especially something that is very strong for our younger saints. They should understand in the, whatever situation they're in that it is God's desires will for them not to be involved in fornication. That should not be a part of their life. They shouldn't be following the, the people around them that are unsaved. They should be living separate. And yeah, sometimes that means people are going to mock us. You know, they're going to make fun of us. But that's where it comes back to first giving ourselves to the Lord then giving ourselves to other saints, paying attention to the fact that we are ones who are actually, we belong to God and we're serving him. Not allowing the, the, the world to manipulate us into doing things that are actually very harmful to our body, by the way. Because fornication is very harmful to the physical body. That's not God's desire as well for us to be involved with that. Be thankful for and in everything. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18 talks about this. Now again, by the way, as Paul is expressing this, this is experientially knowing God's will. It's living it out. In this situation I'm about to be involved in, can I actually be thankful about it? Am I expressing an attitude of gratitude towards God? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the desirous will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Can I be thankful? Don't go to the other side and say, I have to be thankful, because that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, in everything, we should have an attitude of gratitude towards God. And if in a certain situation we are not going to have that attitude, we shouldn't be involved in it. Now, remember, being thankful actually comes from being spiritual. So we focus on being spiritual, but we're looking at a situation and we're weighing it and we're saying, well, that's not a situation that's going to bring me to a mindset where I'm going to be thankful of the situation and understanding it. Experientially know the riches of the glory of the indwelling Christ. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. Colossians 1.27 says, to them God willed to make known. Again, that's your desirous will. So it's God's desirous will to make known 
what are the riches of the glory of this mystery? That glory is a proper expression of a proper opinion. It's expressing a proper opinion. So we actually are ones who are to express a proper opinion of Christ in us, the hope of glory, that hope of God's opinion of us. The riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Experientially know it. We as Christians should live it out. This is, is living out who you are in Christ. Now, if the situation really requires you to hide who you are in Christ, why would you be involved with that? And this could be in a lot of different areas, a lot of different areas in our life. Or if you're not able to manifest who you are in Christ, we know that it is not something that we as Christians should be involved with. We are to not just know it, but experience it. Experientially know the riches of the glory of the indwelling Christ. Living out Christ. Christ is the one who's living out through us. Manifesting that character in a way to where it's um, impacting our everyday life. That is God's desire as well for us as Christians. Now, by the way, there is most places we can do that. Even if we face persecution, we can still do it. That should be a heavy focus on us. And oftentimes it's something we need to remind ourselves, very much need to remind ourselves of. Another aspect of God's desire as well is that you ask for yourself. Remember, we are all priests. All of us are priests. And all of us should be communicating to God in a proper way. We should actually, as Christians, understand how to communicate to God in a proper way. And I am not talking about a secret method that you say certain words in a certain phrases in, in a certain way, and you're going to get everything you want from God, because that's not how our relationship with God works. Um, so are the saints of the church the only saints that are priests? Well, okay, the question would be, are the saints of the church the only saints that are priests? And no. Um, Israel has a priesthood. Is that what you're referring to? No, I was thinking like war in the tribulation when there's the 34,000 and um, are we church does the interceding there ah there? okay yes um so yeah not all saints are priests and not i mean not all saints of all dispensations are priests so saints that are in the tribulation period they're never referred to as a priest uh, priesthood is actually part of our position that we have in god that would be the church's position that we have so yes it is unique to the church that all who are in the church are actually saints are are all saints in the church are actually priests. There we go. That's sort of distinction of what this is. And that is very much a distinction of our dispensation and, and the church. Yeah, it really is. Which means we, you know, well, I mean, you take good example of this with Israel. A, a normal Israelite couldn't actually just communicate to God. What did he have to do? He had to go to the priest. And the priest would communicate to God. So he wouldn't go ask for himself. He would go to the priest and ask the priest to ask for him. But we as members of the church are priests, and we're not to go to another person and ask them to ask God for something. We need to go to God and ask it for ourselves. That's so important. And ask properly. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Now, this is a confidence that we have in him, that if we ask according anything according to his desirous will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition or that is which we, that will, which we requested, that we asked of him, we actually have it. Now, it's according to his desirous will. Well, in order to ask according to God's desirous will, we're going to need to know what his desirous will is. The only way we can know God's desires will is to put the situation to the test and determine, is this actually something that God wants me involved in? 
and we weigh that by understanding what God's revealed desires will already is. We don't want to be involved in something where we're, we're violating what we already know is God's desires will for us. A good example of this is thinking that we are going to go over to another city where we cannot fellowship with saints because there aren't any saints around, but we're going to make a lot of money. And we could go over there and we could make a lot of money and then we could come back and maybe we could benefit the saints here. Scripture actually shows that is not what God wants us to do. It's not about money. It's about fellowship with the saints. It's about growing and maturing, understanding what God wants. And of course, we should be asking for ourselves. That too, I think, is kind of important because when we begin to ask for ourselves, we begin to understand our relationship with God better. Because if I'm asking and I'm not receiving something, why am I not receiving it? Because I'm not asking correctly. I'm asking so I can consume it of my own desires. I'm not asking according to God's desires. And how do I know that? Because if I ask according to his desires, I will receive that which I ask for. Now, this is an interesting thing to experience. Where you ask God for something, you weigh the situation, you look at it. It could be a job. Let's take a job for an example. God, you know, do you want me to work where I'm at? Or I have another opportunity to go over to this other position. And I really would like this other position, this other place, this other company. Maybe it's more convenient for me or other stuff like that. Weigh the situation. In the situation, it doesn't, it's not going to change where my location is. I'm still going to be able to fellowship with the saints. I'm still going to be able to manifest who I am in Christ. I'm going to ask him, can I do this? And then next thing you know, you get a call from the company because you interviewed and stuff. And they're like, hey, we'll offer you a job. And you understand it's God's desirous will that you're actually in that you asked and he gave it to you. And later you find out maybe they gave you the job, but they don't really know why they gave you the job. You know, and I mean, you know, you had a bunch of candidates and they were like, well, you know, we don't exactly know why. You're like, well, I asked God and he gave it to me. And there's other aspects of where when we ask God according to his desires, will he will give it to us. It's something we should experientially know. Do good in every part of your manner of life. This is something that God wants us to do. This is so important when it comes to the Christian life and weighing things. Can we really do something in this situation that's beneficial? Or are we going to be involved in something that is not good, that's not beneficial? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, excuse me, First. First Peter chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. For this is the desirous will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using our liberties as a cloak for a vice, but as bond servants of God. And now your word vice there is actually doing things that are wrong. It's your word kakos, which means uh, things that lack in character would be the reference there. By doing things that are beneficial, we are going to actually put to the, these ignorant, foolish people who speak out against God and speak out against uh, Christians, we're going to put them, what is it talking about? We're going to cause them to be silent. Why are they going to be silent? Because when they falsely accuse us of things and people look at our actions, our actions are going to speak for us. But not using our liberty in Christ as if it is a cover for us doing things that are wrong. This goes back to actually living out from faith, living by grace. Living by grace is not a license to sin. Living by grace is a license to actually manifest righteousness. We should never use our liberty in Christ as an excuse to actually do something that's wrong. How could a Christian do that? God forgave me for it. He'll forgive me for this. It doesn't matter if I do it. That's not a good attitude at all to have. Yet uh, some saints, they have that kind of attitude. That's not God's desire as well for us. 
his desirous will is that our actions actually show who we are in Christ. And by our actions, we put to silence these ignorant men. Not by our words, by our actions. Suffer in some circumstances for your consistent testimony. First, first, first Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. For it is better if the, if the desirous will of God be done to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now your word evil here is your word wrong. Don't, don't think if you're doing something wrong, if, you're, if your attitude that you're presenting isn't an attitude that relates to who we are in Christ, and maybe it's through expressing anger or other things like that, that you're really just manifesting a rotten attitude. We shouldn't be suffering for that. And if we suffer because of that, we're not suffering righteously. But if by doing good, we're suffering, that is God's desire as well, that sometimes we will suffer. And we need to keep doing what is good. And sometimes face that persecution. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 19 also talks about this. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the desires will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Don't let the evil of this world influence us to the point to where we're starting to do things that are wrong so that we're not being persecuted. Do things that are right and face the persecution. Because remember, we actually belong to a faithful creator. There's more value in that than anything that this world offers us. <clears throat> Living the remaining time in the desires will of God and not in the flesh. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 2 talks about this. That he, and now in the context here, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same frame of mind. So our focus is the same frame of mind as Christ had. Remember, Christ, he is God in the flesh. He came down here. He wrapped himself in flesh, and he was obedient to the Father to the point of death. We should be paying attention to that. He suffered in the flesh. Uh, uh, therefore, he who has suffered in the flesh ceases from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his life or the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the desirous will of God. That's what our focus needs to be as Christians. Is it about what I desire? Is it about pleasing the flesh? Or is it about how I can actually manifest who I am in Christ? What's the, what's the situation really about? Our focus should be on God. Yes, we want things down here. We want a nice place to live. We want comforts and other stuff like that. But they should not be such a desire that we're willing to sacrifice fellowshipping with the saints, helping others, and living out who we are in Christ. We shouldn't, it just should not be that part of our lives. Now remember, we discern the desires will of God by using the renewed mind that we have. We have a new mind in Christ. And what does that mean? That means because we are now connected to God in our spirit, our rational part, we can understand the things of God. It also means we should not be using our emotions as a measure by how we're actually pleasing God, whether it makes us feel good or gives us a funny feeling or the hairs on our back stand up or anything. That's not a relationship with God. That's emotions. Our emotions should be rational. Our, our interaction should be rational, not emotional. And we need to use that renewed mind that we now have a mind that can actually understand the things of God and put them to the test. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, of course, is where he specifically said that. Be transformed, that is, be metamorphosized by the renewed mind that we have in Christ. That's God's desire as well for us as Christians. And that is something that we as Christians so need to be reminded of all the time. Matter of fact, it wouldn't hurt to have this on a piece of paper that you carry around with you 
and look at it and say, hey, in this situation, am I actually doing what I know is already God's desire will for me? And then what about, what about if I find that, hey, I got two different directions I could go and both of them actually would fully satisfy the desires will of God? What do I do then? You pick the one that you want to pick because you're within God's desires will either way. That would be involved in a relationship where we're enjoying what we're doing. Like, hey, I would prefer to do this over this. I could do either one, and both of them are within God's desires will. Do the one that pleases you most. Nothing wrong with that. That's what he wants us to do. And, of course, he also talks about... <clears throat> And he also talks about being filled with this experiential knowledge in his desires, will in wisdom. So in wisdom, of course, remember, wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. Okay? Wisdom is not knowledge. We need knowledge so that we can use wisdom. Uh, we can use, <clears throat> we need knowledge so that we can be wise about how we actually use it. Our wisdom is in Christ, so our knowledge should relate to who we are in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Our wisdom, it relates to who we are in Christ. So our knowledge needs to be understanding who we are in Christ. So we're manifesting and using that knowledge correctly, wisely. So not only experientially knowing God's desires will, but doing it in a way where we're taking that knowledge and we're using it wisely in our lives. It is not a wisdom of this world. We don't want to take worldly wisdom and try to apply this to our lives as Christians. Through wisdom, that is the world's wisdom, the world chose not to know God, didn't want to experientially know God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 talks about that, or well, really it's from 18 down, where it talks about the fact that we as humans at a time when we all knew God chose to reject God. That was our wisdom, is we're going to reject him, we're going to go our own way. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21 also talks about this. Over here in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, it says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message of preaching to save those who believe. Now to the world, preaching is foolishness. But yet through that, God is saving people. What is the message we preach? Because it's foolishness to the world. To believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again on the third day is all you have to do to be saved is foolishness to the world. But that is the truth. And God is actually showing the foolishness of the world, the wisdom through that. Because the, the, remember, wisdom always comes from knowledge. So they would have had a knowledge. And, and again, this goes back to Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and down, where all humans had an experiential knowledge of God. They knew God. And they chose to, in their wisdom, reject the knowledge of who God truly was and replace it with who he wasn't. Yeah. So it's not as though they, so, they didn't know God. They did know God. They did know God. And they made a decision. Yes. They did know God. And in their wisdom, they decided they didn't want to know him for who he was. They walked away from it. Yep. They, they uh, the wisdom of the world you often see in debating. You know, debating is something that we as Christians shouldn't be involved with. Now, remember, debating is not defense of the gospel. Debating is about who presents their argument the best. It has nothing to do with truth. It's always about how you present your argument. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world. Don't want to get involved in debating, but we do want to properly defend our faith. 
You want to understand why you believe what you believe. It, of course, is foolishness. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. So if the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God, why would we use the wisdom of this world to actually experientially know God's desire as well? We shouldn't. Okay. So it doesn't involve, God's desire as well does not involve an experiential knowledge of the world. It involves an experiential knowledge of who we are in Christ so that we're taking that knowledge and we're using it wisely. We're using it properly. The wisdom of the world does actually have an appearance of wisdom. The things of the world, they want to try to appear to be wise. And this is a good example of how you can really start to identify wisdom that isn't from God. These things indeed having an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. Fish on Friday. Well, yeah, I'm talking about religious, not if you want to have fish on Friday. I'm talking about a religious um, requirement. Uh, certain holidays, other things like that. Having a self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body. Monks and other things like that are a good example of this because they will make their body suffer but the reality is, it's just a self-imposed religion that they're trying to show themselves to be righteous or wise before God through their own works. This is the world system. But are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. You know, a lot of times, and monks are a good example of this, they go off and they hide in caves because they want to get away from the world because they can't control their desires. That's not, gonna, that's not how you control a desire. The desires from the flesh are controlled by taking the way of, of escape for us as Christians. We have died to the flesh, that is to the sin nature that's in the flesh. We've died to it. That is, we don't need to respond to it because in Christ, we've died to it. Christ's death and resurrection is attributed to us. It, we are now dead to, and, and what that really means is the sin nature doesn't control us anymore like it used to. We can actually recognize it for exactly what it is. And now we don't say no to it. What do we do is we count ourselves to be dead to it, alive unto God. And we start living a life that actually focuses on doing what God wants us to do. We actually have victory over our sin nature. We don't do that by self-imposed religion, false humility, or neglecting the body. You don't do that by fasting or other things like that. That's not going to help. That's a world system kind of thing. Now, wisdom is for the mature. So as we grow and we mature, wisdom does actually uh, involve maturity. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8 talks about this. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So again, it's not a wisdom that relates to the world, but we do actually speak a wisdom. And the wisdom that he's talking about here is it involves the mystery of God, which is the fact that Christ is in us, manifesting who we are in Christ. You see this in verse 7. The wisdom of, of the mystery of God, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for his glory. Remember, a mystery is something that was hidden, but is now revealed. And in the context, if the, if the rulers of this world understood that crucifying Christ would have resulted in his resurrection and the, man, and the creation of the church, they would have never done it. But they didn't understand it. In the, in the world's mind, the fact that God came in the flesh and was subject to physical death was foolishness to them. And they took advantage of it, but they didn't realize what they were actually doing. But we as Christians can understand that. 
not a wisdom of men. First Corinthians chapter two and verse 13. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual concepts with spiritual words. Putting together things properly in a spiritual, and now remember spiritual is rational, we're understanding scripture. You ever wondered why an unbeliever can't read scripture and understand some of the very basic things that are in scripture? It's because it requires comparing spiritual concepts with spiritual words, and they can't do that. But we as Christians can. And that should be a part of our life. The wisdom of Christ is in us. The hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. Him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Now this is a proper use of knowledge. That we may present every man mature in Christ. It, will, it involves with who we are in Christ. And living that out. We as Christians, of course, should be walking in wisdom, and not just wisdom among, our, uh, among the saints, but also in wisdom among those who are outside. Remember who they are and walk wisely. We use the world system. We don't abuse it. Walk wisely. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. Redeem the time. That's for us as Christians to pay attention to. And like I said, we use the world, but we don't, we don't abuse it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 31. And those who use this world is not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. We use it for the benefit of who we are in Christ and to be able to manage things down here on earth, but we don't get to the point to where we're allowing it to consume our life. We are ones who are to be walking honestly. Now, the world system doesn't like that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 12. Here it says that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Don't lack anything you are in Christ. Walking in a worthy, and your word proper there is actually in a worthy manner. To those who are without. Of course, this would involve having a good reputation, too. You're, you're a person that people outside of the church understand. You're a person who keeps your word. First, First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7 talks about this. Moreover, now this specifically, by the way, is talking about a pastor. But a pastor is an example. And as an example, we should actually be following that. Moreover, he must be of a good testimony among those who are outside the church. At least he fall into reproach and a snare of the devil. Having a good reputation wherever we go. Being ones who are actually honest. Being ones who speak the truth. And then he goes on to talk about also in spiritual understanding. So a full experiential knowledge of the desirous will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, spiritual understanding, I want to talk about that more, but we're running out of time. So we're going to dig a little bit more into that, God willing, next week. Because remember, the spirit is our rational part. And we are talking about seeing things as they really are.